Thank you, Richard. Uh, we're dealing with spiritual intimacy today. As uh, uh, we think about that, I'll tell you, as I saw the schedule and saw uh, this topic, and I thought, I don't know what that is. Uh, and then it turned out that it was my time to teach that, and I thought, what am I going to do? Uh, and uh, the more I worked on this, this is probably my favorite lesson of all these in this period. Uh, in uh, Philip's comments this morning, he talked about, did you notice he used the word intimacy at least two or three times as he was uh, leading our thoughts this morning? What is intimacy? And don't you all be hesitant this morning because we have a lot to do. What is intimacy? Quickly. Close. Close. It's the knowing of someone. Knowing of someone. Anything else? Well, I would agree with that to things that, uh, you know, draw us together. Uh, think about, uh, and again, he used this expression then in James uh, 4 and verse 8. Uh, it says that uh, if we draw near to God, he'll do what? He'll draw near to us. So uh, intimacy is an important kind of thing. Spiritual intimacy uh, is something that uh, I think we need to dwell on today because it's a sign, but also... I think it has great value as far as uh, our marriages are concerned. And I'm going to refer a little later on to those of you who are still in the hunting process and not married, because uh, I think there's some things related to that. Um, one of the things that uh, when I started working on this that I found embarrassing, uh, I thought it was again a time that showed how inept I was when we got married. Uh, and I'll make one other reference to that a little later on that's more specific. So, uh, do you or do we as Christians, uh, this has to do with uh, intimacy now, but think about this a minute. Do we as Christians or do you as an individual, do you kind of separate your lives into uh, your holy life and your secular life? Do you do that? Uh, do you think about, uh, well, this is a church thing and then this is my work thing? Uh, I think sometimes we, whether we want to confess that or not, are, are sort of that way. Uh, and we should not be that way. Uh, our, uh, we should uh, integrate uh, our lives together, and whether it's work or whether it's home or wherever it is, uh, those should, should all be the same. Uh, we obviously have different experiences. We have a lot of different responsibilities, but we need to think about uh, our intimacy with God and then for those of us who are married with our mate. Uh, and just think about that God is present and a part of uh, each of our activities. So uh, what is spiritual intimacy? Well, I want to quote a little bit from uh, a book. It's by Wright and Roberts. It's called, uh, oh, it's called uh, Before, Before I Said Yes, Randy, I think is the name of it or something like that. So at least one couple in here is about to say yes pretty soon, or well, they'll have an opportunity to say well, yes. I guess you can do whatever you want to. Then. <laughs> but then you, depending on what you say, to have some bearing on how it ends. Uh, so in, in, uh, in this book that he has written, he talks about spiritual intimacy. And here's what he says. And, and on your handout, I've uh, uh, enumerated these four things that he has on there. Uh, but here's how they're uh, written by uh, Wright and Roberts. Spiritual intimacy is a heart desire to be close to God and submit to his direction for your lives. So that's one. It's a desire to serve God and to uh, uh, do his, his desire. Secondly, it is the willingness to seek his guidance for those who are married together and to allow the teaching of his word in your everyday life. It is a willingness to allow God to help you overcome any discomfort over sharing spiritually and learning to see your marriage as a spiritual adventure. Now, that's not exactly the way he wrote that because he wrote this more for those who are about to be married. So for those of you who are not married, those of you who are still hunting, uh, and for those of you who are about to be married, uh, read, it reads this way. It is a willingness to allow God to help you overcome any discomfort over sharing spiritually and learning to see your coming marriage as a spiritual adventure. Uh, and a lot of times I'm convinced we don't really see 
uh, our marriages as, as that kind of adventure. Uh, and, and in that regard, Randy had mentioned uh, Wednesday night uh, a little booklet. It's uh, entitled God Through Us, and it's written by Adam and Jensen Nicholson. Uh, and uh, they wrote this book. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a big book. I have 50 pages, maybe. Uh, and they wrote this book after they had been married one year. Uh, now, it's not a... Uh, and and I, I have... I have read it uh, casually, I'll say. I have scanned it. I, I haven't read every word in it, uh, and it's 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 a good it's a good little book. It booklet. They don't. I don't think they mention their ages in there, do they? But they're they're fairly young, uh, and they begin with when they dated, uh, and they wrote this book after they. I know I just said this. They wrote this book after they'd been married one year, uh, and when I have read this. The thing that embarrasses me most is I told you all in the introductory class that I taught, when we got married, I thought, you know, marriage is a lark. Uh, marriage is a lark. Uh, I've got this. Uh, I, this, this. I've just got all this. I, I won't have any problem with this at all. Uh, and that, and I, as I read through this book, I was embarrassed to think how ill-prepared I was for marriage. And here is this young couple. Uh, and they have to be, I would think, in early to mid twenties. They'd been married. That's the third time I've said that. No. <laughs> They've been married one year, and they write a book about their marriage. Uh, now, I don't think it's a great treatise on marriage, but it is to me. Uh, when I read that, I think those are two great people uh, to be able to to write at that point in their lives what they did about marriage. So uh, now, for those of you who are not married and those of you who are seeking, you seek somebody who can help you uh, be spiritually intimate with God. Uh, and that's one of the lessons that uh, I got out of that book. They don't even, as far as I know, they don't even mention spiritual intimacy. Uh, but uh, they had obviously done a lot of preparation as far as how they lived their lives. So. Spiritual intimacy, just two or three other things. Uh, in marriage requires both mates to submit to the Lordship of Christ rather than competing with one another. Mates need to share beliefs about Jesus, who he is, and need to both grow as children of God. Now, dating, and in your early married years, in the uh, emotional aspect of your, in the honeymoon and the post-honeymoon period, uh, in early marriage and in that period, uh, the relationship is uh, more emotional intimacy, and it creates, and I'm going to use two sets of terms here, it creates kind of a heart-to-heart -heart bond. And then uh, as you have a physical relationship with one another, you have kind of a body-to-body -body, uh, relationship. And then what you should seek in this, though, is a soul-to-soul -soul relationship. Your soul to your mate's soul, and both of your souls to God. Uh, and it should then lead to a, a spiritual <coughs> kind of intimacy. Uh, and you have, you have God, and you have a husband, and you have a wife, and the focus needs to be uh, God-centered as far as all the things that you do. Uh, I, I never did uh, finish maybe a couple other things on what... Uh, Wright and Robert said, well, the concluding thing they say is that um, if, you, if you have a God-centered kind of marriage, then you're going to go to God in the decisions you make, uh, and uh, that's going to be the thing that helps you bond to one another and bond to God. So that's kind of the introduction as far as uh, spiritual intimacy is concerned. Any, any comment or any uh, addition to that? Anything you want to say about that? Any value of that to you? Does that, does that uh, prick you any? As I said, uh, uh, I read this and I think that was not me when Rose and I married. Uh, she's helped me in that regard, so I've gotten a little better, but I still haven't reached the ultimate. I'm still not at ultimate spiritual uh, intimacy, I'm sure. Anything? With an application, this is point three on the handout. Uh, and that is the ultimate in spiritual intimacy. 
And basically, uh, and I'm going to go a little fast here, basically that has to do with prayer. Prayer can strengthen the intimacy with God and with your mate. Uh, turn to 1 Corinthians, if you will, chapter 7. Uh, Scott, I'm sure when he teaches the lesson on sex, that he'll uh, have you read 1 Corinthians 7. But uh, I want to read it here as far as uh, looking at uh, prayer and the significance of prayer. 1 Corinthians 7 has to do with the answer to one of those many questions that the Christians had written Paul saying, tell us what we need to do about this, because he said in verse 1, now concerning the things of which I wrote, uh, you wrote to me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. You can forget that part. Number two, verse two. Uh, Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, but each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to the wife affection to her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Now, that's not the end of that. Verse 5 is what we're going to look at here. Do not deprive one another except for consent for time. Why? That you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So it's interesting to me that he uh, links prayer as uh, a significant part of this picture. So I would say to you, all of us married folks and to those who might be, that prayer is just so significant as far as we think about our relationship with our mates and our relationship with God. Uh, we looked at 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, 1 Peter 3, 7 is a passage that has, uh, I guess, gotten my attention several times. Some of you are familiar with that, 1 Peter 3, 7. Uh, the first part of that, in effect, says treat your wife right. And if you don't, what may happen? If I know that passage, that your prayers not be what? That your prayers not be hindered. Uh, so there is a connection between all those things and uh, a thing that, that we need to recognize. A lot of other passages that, uh, and let me see, I've got several on here about uh, prayer. Uh, you know, in, uh, in Colossians 4.2, continue earnestly in prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Pray without ceasing. And then the statement that I've written on here that I really like and you may not, this is on uh, item three. When a husband and a wife bow their heads, hold their hands, I've said clasp their hands, and reveal their souls before God, it can be the ultimate spiritual intimacy. And just think about it. Uh, again, you've got the three parties involved. You've got the husband, the wife, and God. And when, when you pray together, uh, that draws you closer to God and should draw you closer to one another. So, uh, prayer is, uh, is extremely important in this relationship. Uh, I am convinced that in prayer, a joint prayer, that uh, couples reach a level of intimacy uh, that you don't find otherwise. In, in Genesis 2 and 24, you remember when God had created uh, husband and or man and woman not husband and wife when he created man and woman and he said they were one what they were one flesh uh, we had that repeated of course in uh, Christ in Matthew 19 6 and then Amos says in, in uh, Amos, the book of Amos in 3 3 if two walk together uh, like two can't walk together unless they're what you might know the end of that unless they're agreed uh, so again in prayer uh, we're drawn closer to each other and we're drawn closer to God. So, uh, comment about that. Anything you want to ask? Anything you want to say? Going back to the 1 Corinthians 7 verse, Yes, sir. Uh, I, I had never really followed through on that thought all the way about giving yourselves to fasting and prayer. Right. Um, and just kind of the thinking that thinking that through a little bit the only thing that should or could supersede the intimacy within the marriage relationship is the intimacy with God. Right. Supersedes that intimacy. And uh, that's a great thought. Which says something about the impact of all that. Good. Thanks, Brett. Anybody else? Well, then we'll go into another topic on spiritual intimacy. And the next one there has to do with the question I've asked about uh, have you have you thought about 
examples in the scripture, and I'd use the word analogy, uh, maybe it's parallelism, whatever it might be, where the scriptures use uh, various uh, terms uh, in the marriage picture to describe God's relationship, uh, sometimes with people and sometimes with the nations. Have you thought about that? What's an example of that? Where God does that? If I remember, maybe I'm not asking that right. You all understand that question? Where God does what? In the text where there is a parallel, there is an analogy of how God relates to nations or people as to marriage. So he, he talks about Israel as being an adulterous wife. Yeah. And he's uh, longing for her, but it's the pain that he feels. Yeah. Uh, and he said that in, uh, I don't know whether, I've got that passage on there. I don't know whether we'll read that or not here at the time. But where uh, God uses through his prophets that frequently with uh, Israel, when they uh, were into whoredom, when they were into infidelity. Uh, now, how were they into infidelity as a nation? I'm sorry? Worshiping other gods. Worshiping other gods. And we saw that frequently. You know, finally they get to the point uh, they were following Moek, some of them, and r running their children through fires. Uh, is that, uh, and, and it may not fit, but I tie this into this topic. I'll try to do that a little bit. Uh, to you, is, is that a good analogy? Is that a good, good, why, why, if that is a good analogy, why is that a good analogy? Well, we understand about infidelity and fidelity in marriage, right? I mean, that's pretty clear. Uh, I would ask the women, you, you don't have to respond, but you may if you, if you want to. Uh, how, how do you, and if your husband was, uh, uh, was not faithful to you, how would you feel about that? Well, you'd feel you'd been defiled, you'd been let down, you'd been all those things. So God felt that way about whom? About the Israelites. And he also feels that way about who else? Just the Israelites? Those of us who are living right now. So to me, it's such an interesting analogy that you find probably, what book in the Bible does that remind you of? I'm sorry? Somebody said that. Hosea. Hosea. Uh, God says to Hosea, do what? What do you, what do you require him to do? Marry a, a, a harlot. I've sometimes said, you know, that marrying her because her name was bad enough. Uh, her name was Gomer. Uh, and uh, so, so, you know, you marry Gomer and she's a harlot. I mean, that's two losses. Uh, uh, boy, I hope nobody in here is married to a harlot. I hope your grandfather's not a harlot. I mean, not Gomer. But, uh, but anyway, anyway. Uh, it, it is it, it is such a it's such a word picture, isn't it? That when when uh, when God uh, has him marry a harlot, and then there in chapter three, uh, she has been unfaithful and has a child by somebody else, and God tells him to do what? Bring her back. Wonder what lesson God's teaching on that one. Maybe forgiveness. So it is, it is such, a marriage uh, is such a picture for us in the scriptures. And there's so many other things, uh, so many other passages there that uh, in, in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, Christ is referred to as the what? I'm sorry? The bride of what? The, what? He's, he is the... He's the uh, that deals with the church, and he's referred to as a bride, the bridegroom. Uh, just a host of passages uh, that that use this analogy. Now, the reason I mention this here, uh, if it's if it's the fidelity in marriage, is important enough for God to use either side of that coin 
uh, in the scriptures, then that must say something about how significant the relationship between husbands and wives are and the fidelity uh, that is to, uh, is to be present there. Uh, other, other comments about all that? Paul, isn't that basically the, the foundation for the whole book of Hebrews? I think, I think it's a part of it. Sure, John. Yeah. Comment on that. Why? How? Well, he, he's, he's, talking, he's, talking to, he's writing to Christians who, who have had begun serving him, but now have decided that they want to go back to the ways of the old law. Right. And, 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 and so he says in chapter 2 and verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by, and I'm not going to read the whole rest yeah. of that book, but, but that's, you, you know, he's talking to people who had obeyed the gospel, but now they're wanting to go back to those old ways of the law, and he said that, 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 that doesn't work. So what's the application of that for us? If we are unfaithful to God, we're going to be just like those people were. Uh, and it's like that the whole God and Israel thing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're talking about a spiritual kingdom versus the physical kingdom of Israel. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, you know, frequently, and the one I'm thinking about here is it, uh, I think it's in Mark 8, 838, uh, that Jesus referred to them as an adulterous generation. Well, we just uh, need to think about how in our time we relate to that, Eddie? Well, let's go back to what he was saying about going back to the old law. Like, let's put that in marriage. Like, once we get married, we can't go back to our old life. You know, I see a lot of people, you know, husbands and wives, that they want to still act like they're single when they're married. And it's not that they want to, like, sleep around or anything like that, but they still want to go hang out with the boys or whatever like they used to. And it's like, that, that like, doesn't mean you can't still have fun with friends. But yeah, that's, it's different now. Like you've got a commitment that you didn't have before, and you got to honor that, and you got to you got to make that bond, like you were talking about earlier. That's just in Australia. We don't do that here. Yeah, that's just, <laughs> that never happens. For those who don't know, Eddie and his wife are living in Australia, preaching there. Well, anything else on this topic? So, all of these lessons, I hope, point to the fact that we need to be drawn close to, to God not just individually, but also as a, as a pair, as mates. Uh, and what, <coughs> excuse me, one mate, mate needs to uh, help the other. On that point, uh, right quickly, you think of any, any examples of mates in Scripture who were, uh, who exemplified uh, spiritual intimacy by their lives? Any husbands and wives you think about there? Not, there are not a lot that I think of that uh, in the scriptures. Anybody? Priscilla. Priscilla. Who said that? Priscilla. Thanks. Priscilla and Aquila. We see that in. Uh, oh, we see that in Romans and uh, in uh, in Acts in Ch Acts chapter eighteen three or four times. Priscilla and Aquila. We don't know a lot about them, but uh, they're favorable. Who? You think of anybody else? Well, I'll mention one that you all will want to counter. What about Sarah and Abraham? You know, they, they had a uh, problem with honesty a time or so, a couple of times. Uh, but uh, if, you, if, you think about, uh, if you think about Genesis 18, Genesis 18 is where the three come to see uh, Sarah and Abraham and are going to tell them what? You're going to have a child. You're old people. You're going to have a child. Uh, and there, and the first thing Abraham says to Sarah is go do what? Put on a pot and make some cakes and then they, and, and you see the interaction between the two of them. And then later on in, uh, oh, it's down about, I think, verse 18 or 19, I'm not sure about the exact verse. Uh, it seems to me that God's kind of arguing with himself. And uh, he's saying, well, should I, should I talk to Abraham about what's going to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah or should I not? And he finally decides he should because uh, he says Abraham is going to be a great father. Uh, and then, of course, when you get to 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter says a favorable thing about Sarah because it says that, uh, you know, she loved her husband, not in those words, but that's the point here. Do you think of any others? Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph? Okay. We don't know much about them. 
that's uh, the the lesson Sunday is going to be on uh, on uh, parenting, and I'm going to talk about uh, uh, Mary and Joseph briefly. You think about any any other couples? One that I think about are uh, Hannah and Elka. You know the the parents of whom? Samuel. Uh, and uh, we don't have a lot. Uh, it's First Samuel chapters one and two is where you have that. We don't we don't find a lot of information about them, uh, but the things that they do there would indicate uh, they have a close bond with one another and a close bond with God. Uh, so there are several there. Uh, you can think about that. Now, the only reason I would mention that is we would ask ourselves, well, what are all these people? The, the ones we read in there, what do they have in common? Well, they put who for? Who put the, in the center of their lives? They put God in the center of their lives. So it would be a good, good example for us. Um, anything else? Well, the next item on your handout is... Uh, uh, what are things that can inhibit spiritual intimacy? I don't like to be negative, but I ought to be with these other positive. He's okay. That's all right. <laughs> he doesn't bother me. What are things that would inhibit spiritual intimacy in your marriage? Selfishness. Selfishness. Is that all? So... Do any of you are any of you intimately spiritually? If so, what do you have to overcome? What causes it? What keeps you from bonding closely to your mate and to God? Children. Children. Who said that? <laughs> Children. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree. Not personal experience. <laughs> Not personal. <laughs> That's, that's Sunday. We'll get, come back to that one. I have, children not on my list, but I think that's a good, good hand. It's a challenge. Not in, It doesn't totally inhibit you, but it is a challenge. What else? Any form of idolatry. Any, Any form, form of like idolatry. Like your job, yeah. your uh, hobbies, yeah. any of that. Does your husband play golf? No. Okay, so we can't use golf. <laughs> Very good, yeah. What else? When, a mate, when one walks away from one, yeah. from God, from yeah. life and with God. That's going to be in the last lesson I do in this class. What else? Well, what, what inhibits you from serving God the way you should? It can be like a lukewarmness or, un, or, or, or a lack of commitment or dedication. Yeah. Yeah. What, about, what about just busyness? We all say we're what? We have no time. We are so busy. Now the bad news for you is when you retire, you're also busy. Uh, but you have a lot more free time. What else? Anything else? What keeps you from being too close to God as you should? Yourself. I'm sorry? Yourself. Yourself, yeah. Selfishness? Power. Priorities, all those kinds of things. Well, I didn't even plan for us to do an exhaustive list here, but the point about this is you think about that and what keeps you from being uh, as close to your mate as you should be and what keeps you from being as close to God as you should be. Uh, the last two things on here uh, before the bell rings, uh, one is uh, something I took out of a book by... Uh, <coughs> Sean Bain, uh, some of you know Sean Bain. Sean and his wife uh, do a good bit of counseling and he preaches. And this is a book he just published. It's called Marriage, a Reflection of God's Image. Uh, he preaches now in, uh, outside of Nashville, I can't remember which congregation. Which one? Okay. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not sure which congregation. Anyway, these are what he calls 10 principles to keep Christ at the center of your home kind of harks back to the last question about what keeps us from being there. And then there's a passage with that. Just to run down the, through these, remember the builder, and of course the builder in that passage is God. Uh, seek uh, knowledge from the scriptures. Be on the alert for evil. Follow God's directions. Live in oneness. Seek understanding. Develop character values. Who you are is what your family becomes. Uh, Ask God, uh, and on number, on letter G, 
who you are is what your family becomes. Uh, as parents, do you think about uh, the legacy you're leaving for your children? Uh, do you want your children, don't, don't anybody raise their hand on this. Uh, do you want your children to be like you? Uh, somewhat. <laughs> Partly. Maybe avoid some of the mistakes. I see. Okay. <laughs> uh, but you know, we're, we're molding these little ones and the big ones and uh, the characteristic of, uh, I won't get to say this because I'm not teaching class relates to this on this series, but the characteristic of, I'm going to direct this to the wives, the characteristic in your children that you dislike the most is when they do something that your husband does that you don't like. You ever experienced that? That's, you're just like your daddy. Uh, so, uh, you know, think about the impact you have on your children. Ask God to help and choose every day to serve the Lord. Uh, remember the masters of your home, the Lord will return and have a vision for your marriage. Uh, Randy's going to do a lesson on uh, mission statement or whatever that is, Randy. And I assume some of that will, will get, uh, get mentioned. The last one. Uh, and the bell, don't we ring at 1030? Yes. Okay. Uh, so it's going to ring in a minute. Uh, what can you do? Uh, what can you do this week to be drawn closer to your mate? And this is this is kind of your homework. You don't have to bring your homework back Sunday, but this is kind of your homework. What can you do to make your uh, relationship with your husband better? What can you do to make the relationship that you and your husband have, your wife have, to God better? And then on Sunday, we're going to talk about parenting. And um, I guess uh, somebody who says children are in a mission will get to speak. Well, thank you all. <laughs> How's your finger?